Hello, BookTube. Yesterday, I watched a video from David Wiley in which he talked about 60 books that he hopes to read in 2023. They are books from his shelves. He is taking part, or trying to anyway, in the 500 book challenge of reading 500 books you already own before you buy anything new. And it was fascinating to watch. It was fascinating to watch him give at least a vague outline of what his 2023 reading will be like. It got me thinking about my own 2023 reading in ways that don't do me any good, in ways that I'm not actually able to do. I don't posit the new year from the old year, ever. I have no idea if I'll be an ardent reader in 2023. I have no idea if I will be reading in my bailiwick right now, which is new releases in the American book market in the 15 or 16 genres that interest me. I have no idea if either one of those things are true, if I will be reporting about it on BookTube to you. I have no idea about any of that. But it's in 2022, I can look at the new releases for 2023 and come up with 60 titles of my own that definitely interest me now. If I had them in front of me now, I would want to read them. I am hoping, I'm assuming, that if things stay relatively as they are in 2023, I will read a good deal more than 60 books. <laughs> I'm hoping that I will read literally 20 times that many. But, and, and also, you know, any list that I give you here will be the tip of the iceberg, but we can at least go through a few and get a, a feel, kind of a glimpse of some things that are coming down the pike in 2023. We can start with this one. This is by Eckhart Fram. This is Assyria. Big new history of his on the Assyrian Empire, one of the one of the earliest and biggest and strongest empires in the ancient world. Always nice to see ancient history that isn't Greece or Rome. So that would definitely interest me. Interested in a, in a different way, a grimmer way for this next one. This is Bloodbath Nation by Paul Oster, in which uh, in which a, a talented novelist takes a look at America's insane gun problem dealing i assume first with the with the absolutely delusional individuals who say that america doesn't have an insane gun problem of course america does america is by far the most dangerous country to live in and by far by far the highest likelihood that when you step out your front door you will be killed because people can carry assault weapons military style assault weapons uh, weapons capable of of shooting hundreds and hundreds of rounds every second you can carry those things in most states in the Union without any reserv without any restrictions or regulation at all. Uh, <laughs> which means crazy people can get them. It's the, the solutions to America's insane gun problem are very, very easy. They just can't be done because the lobbies that control it have enough power to buy senators and senators make laws. The, the solutions are easy. Other countries have done them. And they have watched their gun violence just drop like that. That's is plain and simple. The guns are the problem. I'm pretty sure, I've never been all that great a fan of Paul Oster's novels, but he's a relentlessly sane author. I'm pretty sure that in the course of this book, he will come to that conclusion if he doesn't start with the conclusion. The guns are the problem. The guns are the problem. <laughs> no matter what you want to do, if you're if you're a strong arm type, then you outlaw them. If you, make, if you want to make sense, then a nationwide buyback program would work. It, it would definitely work. It would get millions of guns off the streets. But I'll be interested to see the take that he has on, on this problem. Then we have, uh, this is a new edition of a book that's had a few editions before. It's popular in some, in some universities. I've never read it. It's Peter Charles Hoffer's book, The Brave New World, A History of Early America. And this is, I think, the third or fourth edition. I can, if I am... Uh, being doom and gloomy about it, I can imagine what a fourth edition of a work like this would have to be in the year 2023. I, I, the fever won't have broken by then, so I, I can imagine what those revisions would be, mostly in the form of hair shirts and flagellation, but I could be wrong. I don't, I don't know the thing at all. I'll have to give it a try, and it, you know, there's a new edition coming out. I think it's larger than any of the earlier ones. I'll have to give it a try in the new year. Then we have the Golden Book, the little Golden Book line. Some of you will know these from your childhood. They are almost relentlessly sweet. They introduce young readers to all sorts of figures from history, figures from pop culture. They have a tough row to hoe when it comes to keeping up that tradition, as public figures especially become more and more debased. It's tougher and tougher to make a little kid's book 
of such figures. I'm not sure I understand the the impetus to do it at all. I'd like to be sitting in on a little Golden Book editorial meeting where they decide, well, we have to do a little Golden Book on, I don't know, Kanye West or whatever, to use a, a, an example from the news. I'm not sure that I, in a meeting like that, I would certainly raise my hand and say, no, we don't. No, we don't have to do a book like that at all. And this latest one, this 2023 release in the Little Golden Book series, is a perfect example of that. They're doing one on George W. Bush. A, a bitter, delusional idiot who started two wars. Unprovoked wars in his presidency. That claim, have claimed hundreds of thousands of innocent lives. And, and, uh, by anyone's definition of the word, a war criminal. How on earth do you make, who's also a deeply unsavory person in his private life, behind closed doors? Maybe not now, I've no idea what age has done to mellow him, but when he was president, he was an ogre. How on earth do you make a little golden book of George W. Bush? I have no idea. Will the little golden book of George W. Bush even mention Iraq? Will it even do that? I, I don't know if it will or not. Uh, let me have this thing. This is uh, by Edward Heach, I think. This is Chinese Dreams in Romantic England. Uh, it's about, it's a, a romantic era book. It's about a, a sort of romantic adjacent character named Manning, who was fascinated with the Chinese world, Chinese literature, Chinese philosophy, for want of a better word. And whose Manning has, hasn't had a full dress biography in the American book market, I don't think ever. If he has, it's been a very, very long time. Interest in the Romantics kind of wanes in America. So we'll give it a try. And uh, this next one is a big, fat subject. If I'm anything like I am now in 2023, this will be catnip. There was no way I'll be able to avoid it. This is Peter Heather's book, Christendom. The Triumph of a Religion. So this goes from AD 300 to AD 1300 drops you off at the doorway of uh, the height of the Inquisition and the beginning, the first flowerings of the Renaissance and then the Reformation. So it, this, is the, the, this is the period from when Christianity was ingrained in the power structure of the Roman Empire to when it reached it, its pinnacles of authority, both spiritual and temporal, in the Western world. I don't remember off the top of my head how big this book is. I'm thinking it would have to be fairly big to cover a subject like this, but it, right now, I would, if it were on my nightstand, I would grab it. And while we're on the subject of Christianity, we can look at this one. This is Mary Hollingsworth writing about the conclave, the, the Christian church's conclave of 1559 uh, to elect a new pope. This will, this will be in great detail a biography of Hippolyta de Este who was a key figure in all of that and a uh, key author. I'm really hoping that, for I have high hopes for this. I have high hopes that it is, if not really long, at least really detailed. The problem is, if you're writing a book like this and you're trying to sell it to a popular audience, you're, you're not selling it to me. You're going to have to spend a lot of time filling in basic material, both biographical and historical and also theological. You're going to have to spend a great deal of time doing that, which will, I think, be to the detriment of the momentum of your narrative. We'll see. I'll hope not. Then we have a novel by Owen King. This is The Curator. There will be fiction in my 2023 reading, I would assume. I would assume there would be. I have to confess, watching BookTube, I'm often very envious of the many, many BookTubers who have very, cons very consciously constricted their reading. I read fantasy. I read science fiction. I read cozy mysteries. And I don't read anything else. I just read that. I read the backlist in that. I reread my favorites in that. And I read all the new releases in that. There are times when I'm very envious of that kind of thing, but I don't think I could live with myself. I don't think I would be, I would be able to sit comfortably in a chair if, if I didn't branch out to stuff that isn't just one particular interest, right? If I were to say, well, I only read ancient Roman history. Uh, and one of the things, one of the types of reading that I do in any given year that almost always disappoints me is contemporary so-called literary fiction. And this is one of them. It's only a matter of time until Owen King started writing about cats, and in this one he does. So it's uh, the worst of both worlds. <laughs> it's contemporary literary fiction, which does not need to be anything or do anything or be good at anything or plot anything, or tell any kind of story, and it's about cats, 
who likewise don't have to be any kind of good pet to keep you feeding them. <laughs> uh, then this next one is Jonathan Littell. This is uh, an oddity. I honestly didn't think this would get a, a version in the American book market. This is The Damp and the Dry. A totally arresting American issue cover. I hope that's the cover they go with. If memory serves, this is about the foremost Nazi collaborator and traitor that Belgium ever saw. And I, even if I've got the, the details of that description wrong, I know this is, that this has had a lot of circulation in the non-American book market. Now it's getting an American edition. It's a, a disturbing subject, but, um, but, but right now, if I had it in front of me, it would definitely be on my TBR. Then we have Barbara Butcher's book, What the Dead Know. This is her looking at, uh, following along, sort of riding along, learning about Homicide Squad in a big city. What goes on, how it's reported, how you investigate it, how the, the ways that you do that differ from the ways they're popularized on TV dramas, that sort of thing. So kind of adjacent to true crime, but still inherently interesting. This next one? Mm. This next one I don't have a whole lot of information about. Uh, maybe one of you does. This is by Paul Dini and the great Alex Ross, the great comic book art artist Alex Ross. This is Shazam! Power of Hope. And this is being offered in a hardcover. And I don't know a bunch about this. This is a reprint. For a few years, Paul Dini and, and uh, Alex Ross did, they did four oversized comic books. Floppy, paperback, oversized comic books. One about Superman, one about Batman, one about Wonder Woman, and one about Captain Marvel. And they were really good. Big, huge panels, a gorgeous showcase for Alex Ross's artwork. And very elementary. No going into the weeds with alternate universes or anything like that. Just the most elementary presentation of the basics of these great characters. And I have all of them. But this isn't an oversized paperback. It's a hardcover. And I don't know... I don't know if it's an oversized hardcover. I would like it if it were a normal-sized hardcover. It would, you would lose a little bit of the glory of Alex Ross's artwork, but it would be a little bit more convenient to use. I would like it if it were a normal-sized hardcover. I also don't know if they intend to do this with the other volumes. I'm assuming that this one is, is front and center in the radar because I'm gathering there's a new Shazam movie coming out, and that therefore you want you want this front and center. I, I could be wrong about the timing of that, but I'm really hoping, I don't know for sure, but I'm really hoping that 2023 shows uh, all a set of all four of these in hardcovers. And I'm hoping the hardcovers are normal-sized. Not not oversized. Oversized is a nice novelty. It's a throwback to oversized treasure editions that were part of Paul Dini's childhood and, and adolescence, but they're kind of dorky to do, and they're a little bit awkward to store and to reread. And what they lose in Alex Ross's, the details of Alex Ross's artwork, I can get in digital format, or I can get by studying them up close, so I don't, don't really need them to be that size. We shall see. It's an interesting project. It's those four stories were later reprinted in a big oversized paperback that included those four stories and Alex Ross drawing a Justice League adventure. And that volume, I think it's called World's Greatest Superheroes, something like that. I go back to that volume a lot. But I, every time that I do, I say to myself, well, gee, you know, some of these individual stories, the individual Wonder Woman story in particular, has a lot, of, a lot more punch when it's all by itself. So seeing them be reprinted in any way is good news for me. Then we go to... History. This is Joanne Paul. This is the House of Dudley, which would be perfectly fine as the subject of a book, except for that weird subtitle, <laughs> which is A New History of Tudor England. Uh, that's weird, and I don't know how, what kind of a job Joanna Paul will do. The, the Dudleys were a prominent family in most of the major years of the Tudor era, but for all the wrong reasons. The Dudley family never saw a person or a cause that it did not immediately betray. <laughs> They're, they're a long family steeped in betrayal, steeped in traitors. They're, so how that forms a history of Tudor England, I guess, in a way it could. Either way, in, this is a rare instance where the subtitle of a book actually increases my intrigue to read it. Whatever you did, however you're viewing the House of Dudley. Given the pattern that took place that, that sort of started to take shape in 2019 and is now in full swing, I'm assuming that this will be Joanne Paul's attempt to validate and defend the House of Dudley. 
which we're, we're just getting that across the board where you present me something that's indefensible and then defend it because everybody's used to crap posting on Twitter and books can take that form <laughs> where all you want is outrage clicks. I don't know if that will be this. I can't imagine that it won't be, but I'll give it a try either way. Then we mentioned, I mentioned, uh, Shazam! The Power of Hope as a new hardcover reprint of something that, you know, I'd want in that form. I am a sucker for that sort of thing. I will definitely get a duplicate of a book I really love if its format is different and interesting. And this next one is uh, very much along those lines. These are the first three Frank Herbert Dune novels in deluxe hardcovers, in, and at least they'll all be offered individually, but they are at least also offered in a box set. Very much Steve Wante. <laughs> I very much would like that. You have original artwork for Children of Dune. Can't really make it out there, but those are the two little Atreides children. Then you you also Dune Messiah and Dune itself. And the cover artwork for Dune, I kind of sort of recognize. The rest I've never seen. I don't think there'll be any new interior artwork, but I'm always up for a new edition of Dune and also a new reread. I will see in the new year if I am still around and I am still interested in these things. I can't imagine I won't want this box set. Can't imagine that I won't. It's just too pretty. This next one is by Lucy Austin, and it is a task. <laughs> it will, I don't know how this will be done. This is a biography of Elizabeth Elliot. And I don't know how long this is going to be, and I, I don't know, more importantly, what kind of approach the author is going to take here. Elizabeth Elliot was a passionate Christian evangelist, a passionate Christian missionary who really took to heart the injunction from her Lord and Savior to go and make disciples of all nations. And that could definitely lead you to write a biography. I don't think she's ever had one before. She very much needs one, very much deserves one. Copious amounts of records, all of it fascinating. But what, what tack do you take when you do this? I think it's 50-50 likelihood that the author is also evangelical. I, I can't imagine that, that the idea to write a biography of Elizabeth Elliot would even come to your mind unless you're evangelical. So will this book... Uh, I guess... Would it, would you, I'll read it anyway. It's utterly fascinating. And I imagine if it's broader, if it's a bigger book and takes into account the life and times, not just the life, so much the better. But I think in the crudest way possible, the question... I. I have about this book boils down to the author's attitude towards Christianity. Basically, is the author writing that Elizabeth Elliot was following an injunction from God to preach the gospel? Or is the author going to write a book in which she says that Elizabeth Elliot was following what she believed to be an injunction from God to preach the gospel? I'm not sure either way that it will hurt the reading experience, but I'm all, when it comes to books like this, I'm always curious to know that. This next one, I mentioned that the convenience of reading, this is, I think, not going to be a convenient size or shape or heft for reading, but it's still a must-have, an absolute must-have. This is The Fantastic Worlds of Frank Frazetta. A big, and as far as I know, the biggest ever collection of his artwork. This is not just the stuff that is in well-known hands, but the... the the powers that be behind this book went trawling all over the place to collectors, to private collectors, to get everything. I'd be willing to bet this will be the biggest and most comprehensive gathering of Frank Frazetta artwork that's ever been done. I have the two previous examples of that, and even when I was enjoying them, I take them down from time to time and enjoy them still. Even when I am, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, you're missing this, and you're obviously missing that. I wonder if I'll think that with this. I'm not so sure that I will. I'd be willing to bet that this will leave me very, very satisfied that you have John Carter on the cover. Uh, we shall see. We shall see how much advertising stuff is in here, how much comic book stuff is in here. A lot of that stuff is in private collector hands who do not like to share. Did you work magic with them? I don't know. I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see. Fazette is important. As an American artist, I think he's important. So the more and the more generous retrospectives we get of him, the better I like it. Then we have, this is inevitable in 2023, a flood of Windsor books, of Windsor biographies that's inevitable because Queen Elizabeth II died in 2022. Uh, her divisive and largely unliked son became King Charles III. That, that's a major upheaval 
in the, the House of Windsor monarchy. So it stands to reason that publishers will not only flush out Windsor titles from that they've had hanging around on their backlist, but also get more. And I'll be interested in a lot of them. Some of them will be very serious. There is, in fact, a book called King Charles III or A Portrait of the King, something like that, that's coming out, I think, in 2023, the first biography of King Charles after his after he became king. This is something else. This is by Sally Bedell Smith, who's a veteran royal watcher and is guilty of her share of hooey, of putting her share of hooey on paper. But she's also really interesting, can be really interesting. This is George VI and Elizabeth. It's called The Marriage That Saved the Monarchy. And there you have we four. You have uh, the king and his wife, who you, most of you will know as the queen mother, and then the two daughters. It's a charming story. It's I have four or five books that tell this exact story. In fact, one of them has this exact title and subtitle. It's usually a story that lends itself to hooey. So maybe it is a perfect subject for a Sally Bedell Smith. There... The way that you can tell when you read a book like this that is meant to be a soft focus sort of Hallmark card celebration of the marriage that saved a monarchy, of the, the love that blossomed between poor King, King George VI with his stutter and Queen Elizabeth, uh, the way to tell whether or not you're reading something that is schmaltz and hooey is whether or not the book even glances in the direction of the fact that, the, that Queen Elizabeth was originally in love with the king's brother. And promised to the king's brother. <laughs> if you, if the book never even mentions that, if it's love at first sight and it was always bluebirds and hummingbirds, then you know you can still read it. But you're reading mythology largely. You're reading palace folklore. And then we have something by Rick Gakowski. This is Guarded by Dragons, another rare book memoir, book about the rare book trade, the author's adventures in finding manuscripts or dealing with Rick Halcitron collectors going to auctions, that sort of thing. A very popular subgenre in its day that I love. I am not a book collector at all. I'm not part of the rare or collectible world in any way. I think it would be madness to go to an auction and just start outbidding people. I think it would be madness to pay more than $10 for a book. <laughs> so, But I, I still find it fascinating. I still look on the the stories told in this world with utter fascination. I have a whole bunch of them. I have a whole bunch of, of books that are just this. They're just about, well, the author had his eye on a collectible item. He knew it was out there. Actually took a plane to Italy or Spain or wherever to try and hunt down the one copy he knew existed. He'd pay anything for it. It seems like insanity to me, but I love reading the books, especially if they're spiritedly done, which I've noticed they often are. And then we have, I think this is a Bloomsbury title. This is by Jeff Jarvis, The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Another book about... The history of print, the history of books, and the technology of bookmaking, which is a subject that endlessly fascinates me. But in this case, the book is, I, I, I gather that it's extending a lot of the lessons of that history of print into the digital era. What is the digital era learning or failing to learn from all of those earlier experiments, from all of that those six centuries of history? If it actually does that, oh my, that would be fascinating. I can think of some of those examples on my own, some of those lessons that the digital world is not learning, that it really should benefit from. Then we have a, a volume, a fat volume from Tuttle. They are a publisher that specializes in Japanese reprints. They, they do absolutely lovely volumes. And I kind of thought they'd already done a volume like this, but this is bigger. It's probably an enhancement of something they've already done and not just an explicit reprint. This is Lafcadio Hearn's Japan. A big volume of the sketches, the stories, the whole books that Lafcadio O'Hearn wrote about Japan a century ago when he fell in love with the country and the culture and the mythology. Hearn has a large number of books on Japan to his credit. To have them all in one beautiful, well-designed, handy, tuttle paperback, that would be very appealing. At least it's very appealing to me now. <laughs> then we have uh, Tova Danovich does a book called Under the Henfluence. <laughs> which is about the allure of backyard chickens, keeping backyard chickens. I know two couples that have started this. They had the room, they had the town ordinance, they had the goodwill of their neighbors, and they decided to start having backyard chickens. They come from one of those couples who's very, very young. The other is not. The other is in late middle age, and they come from a, from completely different viewpoints. The older couple obviously came at it from a utilitarian standpoint. You know, this will provide us with 
a little security in the age of supply chain issues. We'll have we'll have eggs and we'll also have meat. So it provides us it'll provide us a little bit of security, and that's all we're really looking for. We'll build a really strong coop and protective area so that predators don't get at our investment. Whereas the younger couple looked at them first that way, and then about a week started looking at them as pets. And that's been a couple of years, and I can report that both of those couples that I know personally no longer think of these the, the chickens in their yard as either an investment or pets. They think of them as family and would never kill one of their chickens for meat. Never. In a million years. They harvest the eggs. But as one as one person, one of the, that quartet said, the older of the two women said, the only reason she harvests the eggs is because the chickens don't seem to mind. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> and they hatch a lot of the eggs as well. So uh, finding out anything that this author has to tell me about this, this fad and what people think about it, hearing even colorful stories about it, will be great. Just a huge amount of fun. Then we'll, we'll stop having a huge amount of fun. We'll go with Clancy Martin. Clancy Martin's new book is How Not to Kill Yourself. This is Clancy Martin's study of the suicidal mind. I'm not the biggest fan of this author, but this is a serious subject. It could bring out serious writing. I, uh, I'm hoping that the title is not indicative of a sort of moral scolding tone throughout the book. I think it's one thing, one of the don't get me wrong, this is not meant to be a controversial video, and I could go on with you for a whole day on the positive legacies of Christianity, the subject of Christendom in the earlier book that we looked at. I could go on with you forever about that. Societal influences and also personal influences. But Christianity has also had negative influences as well, and one of the most negative of those is the whole shadow of abrobrium that it has cast over the idea of suicide. That is a religious thing. That is a religious stance. And the, the strength that it has in predominantly Christian countries, especially like America, crazy fundamentalist religious countries, is heartbreaking. It leads to tragedy. I, I, the, a, a study of the suicidal mind is one thing. If you are suicidally fixated, if you're, if you're you know, thinking about it all the time, obsessing about it all the time, that's bad. And as a study of that will be very interesting. But the, the end result of that study should not be under no circumstances kill yourself. That is a religious position. That's a Christian religion position that has caused innumerable people to suffer pointlessly, for instance, if they are fatally ill with a, a, with a disease or a condition that in its later stages cannot be medicated for pain if the pain is so bad. You could easily be medicated to die. Your doctor could kill you in three seconds, put you literally out of your misery. The patient can plead for it all they want. They won't do it. The laws are against it because of Christian influence. There are plenty of, there are plenty of examples, plenty of situations in life, not as many as, an, as a, suicide, a suicidally ideologically fixated person would think, but there are plenty of situations in life where it ought to be an option on the table. And where you're not necessarily damned or insane to think of it. I, I'll, I'll have to see. I'll be, I'll be interested uh, re, right now, if this book were in front of me, I would be interested to see what moral stance Clancy Martin is going to take. Clancy Martin does not need to take a moral stance on suicide at all. It's not ultimately a moral issue unless you are also saying it's an, a religious issue. And it isn't a religious issue. <laughs> the reason you, that religious people say it's a religious issue is because they say God is the one who gets to say when your suffering is too much. God is the one who gets to say when you will die. And if there is no God, <laughs> if you say there's no God, then you immediately see that as a religious issue that can hurt you. I mean, it, I, I'm not really sure right now off the top of my head what the laws are in your state, but I'd be willing to bet that the, the, no matter what your medical condition is, or even your financial condition, that no matter what your life condition is, I'd be willing to bet in the state where you're watching, you are not allowed to take your own life. Legally. You're not allowed to have someone else help you so that you're not putting anyone in danger, so that there's nothing traumatic about it, so that you can tell your friends about the time and the day, so that they know and can prepare for it. I'd be willing to bet that's illegal where you live. And it shouldn't be. The contemplation of it certainly shouldn't be. But we'll see. We'll see how far the book goes with contemplation. Then this next one is Peter Wilson. 
Peter Wilson did a big book on the Thirty Years' War that I really, really liked. And you don't have to do a big book on the Thirty Years' War for very long before the subject of this new book comes to your mind, which is uh, the German military tradition. <laughs> this is Iron and Blood. I think this is a big, fat book. Peter, Peter Wilson is a really enjoyable writer to read at any length. And this is a history of German militarism. <laughs> Uh, it's a big subject. It has lots and lots of, uh, again, like with the suicide book, lots and lots of moralizing that will be hovering around it at every inch. We'll see whether or not it avoids that. Then we have Martha Nussbaum. This, she is Her new book is Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. And there you have a humpback whale. Uh, several of them die every year from gigantic line nets that aren't designed to catch them. They're just designed to empty the ocean of anything organic that can be sold for food. They aren't designed to catch humpback whales. That is technically illegal in most in most jurisdictions, but they do anyway. They catch everything anyway. And they the, most of the people that they catch just twist and die. They can't get to the surface anymore. They can't continue moving. They can't extract themselves. So they just twist around and die. And the humpback whale, of course, is a large, very large example, but it's far from the only one. Collective responsibility, it's like with the suicide book and a few other books on this list. I will wonder what tack the author can take here. There is an argument to be made that collective responsibility is also religious. That God instructs humans to be good stewards of all life on earth. Which automatically says, A, it's all yours to do with as you please, and B, you're not part of it. <laughs> you're not a species. You're my creation. You're not a species of life on earth. We shall see. I think the time for our collective responsibility when it comes to justice for animals has effectively passed. There, I don't think there are really enough members of most charisma charismatic megafauna species on Earth to reproduce effectively. And that's if humans disappear tomorrow. As long as humans are around, uh, <laughs> as I've said a few times on this channel, I think your grandchildren will live in a world with no humpback whales, no whales of any kind. They'll live in a world with no elephants, no giraffes, no lions. Outside, maybe, of captive populations in game parks or preserves of some kind or other, but not in the wild, not not never knowing human beings. I could be wrong. We'll see. Books like this could bring about a change. <laughs> and uh, we can go from the profound to um, slightly less. So <laughs> this is J.R. Ward. This is Lassiter. My, that's a rather large pommel you have. <laughs> this is her latest installment in the Black Dagger Brotherhood series, which is unlike 20-something or other books. I've read them all. Uh, it's a series of supernatural warrior hotties that has its own vocabulary and its own history and its own concepts, its own world-building, I guess, in a way. They are addictive. After a while, they are addictive. I'm not saying they're any good but I, I would never miss a Black Dagger Brotherhood book. Then we have something, and this is an author I sometimes do miss, but I am not going to miss this new one. This is Dennis Lehane. A lot of you will know Dennis Lehane, at least from the movies that were adapted from his novels. This is called Small Mercies, and it's about South Boston. It's, at long last, his South Boston novel. About a, a woman just trying to live an ordinary life in Southie, and the forces that are coming to bear on that, social forces political forces, underworld forces. I, I sometimes I sometimes dislike Dennis Lehane because sometimes he seems to be sort of ostentatiously a guy's writer, ostentatiously the kind of, you know, chest-thumping, do-right-by-your-school type guy that where, where every handshake at an author event is a test of masculinity. That sort of stuff drives me nuts, <laughs> absolutely drives me nuts. But this might not be that. Every once in a while, he strikes a register that absolutely is not that. The Given Day, a novel by his, a historical novel of his, is incredibly good. It's an incredibly good historical novel. This is not quite so historical, but I am hoping. I am hoping that this is a masterpiece. I'll certainly read it with a wide open mind. Uh, same thing with this next one. I mentioned in a recent video that uh, author letters can sometimes be tours through mind-numbing tedium. <laughs> I'm hoping that this volume is not that. This is Into the World's Great Heart the letters of the great poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. I think Ben won earlier Edna St. Vincent Millay letter collection. I think this is much bigger, much more sweeping and comprehensive. I'm hoping that it will be much better footnoted. I'm just hoping it will be a wonderful chance for people to talk about Edna St. Vincent Millay in the critical world. Again, that would be wonderful. The more exposure she gets, the better. I like it. Then we have, uh, this is by Dean King. 
who did uh, Skeletons of the Sahara, which a lot of you will know. That was a book club favorite book. Here he's doing a book on John Muir, the great naturalist John Muir from a century ago, who's been the subject of a couple of books in, in the last few months. This is Guardians of the Valley, John Muir and the Friendship that Saved Yosemite. Muir is often credited with saving Yosemite, regardless of who he does it with. The friendship here is not with Theodore Roosevelt. It's with his editor. Hoping that it's just a huge amount of Muir research. Maybe a lot of good new research. That would be wonderful. Then we have uh, an author I really like, Richard Norton Smith. This is a book of his that has been so long in the coming that, like a lot of people, I've been assuming just for years that we would never see it. Turns out it looks like we are going to see it. This is his biography of President Gerald Ford, you know, an ordinary man. Gerald Ford is an inherently fascinating character. He's America's only unelected president and also is America's most guilty president until Donald Trump. On January 6, 2020, Donald Trump, then sitting president, orchestrated, incited, and launched and wanted to personally lead an armed insurrection to overthrow the United States government execute his vice president, and install himself in power illegally. No U.S. president has had ever come close to doing anything that bad. That is, that is one literally for millennia from now to study. But Ford was the worst offender before that, because he pardoned Richard, Richard Nixon. He used the power of the presidency to, to protect Richard Nixon from the justice that was right on his doorstep, and that should have visited upon him. It's an unforgivable sin. It, no one in, in Ford's time forgave him for it. And it's, it'd be, but it, that tends to obscure, even in my own telling, a lot of the interesting things about him. He has some black marks on his reputation, even though his public persona is of just this, an ordinary man, a nice guy, a nice, solid guy. A nice, solid guy who buried a lot of eyewitness testimony for the Warren Commission and pardoned Richard Nixon. So you've got two sides of the scale there. And do they balance? I have waited for a long time to see what Richard Norton Smith would make of this figure in American history. Ford has been almost unchronicled when it comes to this kind of book. That's bewildering to me. I'll be interested to see what he makes when it looks like 2023. We will finally see that. And then we can move to natural history. This is by Miriam Darlington. This is The Wise Hours, where she goes inside the world of owls. Their behavior, their natural history, their, I imagine, locations. You can find owls pretty much everywhere. I'm hoping that she goes into Central Park, maybe Boston Common or uh, the Emerald Necklace here in Boston. I'm hoping that she visits some, I know it's very stereotypical, but nevertheless, it's true, some very ornate old cemeteries are usually homes to owls. Not because of Halloween or Creepies and Crawlies, but because they are largely unvisited by humans and therefore full of game. <laughs> Every every time in the Boston area that I have managed to successfully spot an owl when I went out owling, it was in a cemetery. I don't know what will be in store here, but I'm always up for reading about owls. Obviously, as you can see, there are two owls in the background here. Then we have a kid's book. This is by Patricia Polacco, and it is Palace of Books. It's a library book. It's a kid's book about libraries. As far as I remember, the young character's family relocates to a new city. She, of course, is feeling uprooted. No familiarity, no friends, no nothing. And she finds the library, which is, I'm sure that a lot of you will agree with me, that does work. If you find the library at a place, you suddenly feel like it's not so strange a place after all. It, it, the philosophy, the welcome, really works. We'll see. We'll see how much else is going on in this book. But I couldn't do a list like this and not have a kid's book. Then we have something by Guy de la Boyere. This is his Pharaohs of the Sun, the fall of the Tutankhamun dynasty. So this won't be just about the boy Pharaoh. This will be about a whole chunk, probably 50 years of ancient Egyptian history. And admittedly overstudied 50 years, but you should probably get used to it. I mentioned in an earlier video that late 2022, early 2023 marks the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb and the mania that followed from there. I think we can expect a lot of books on King Tut in 2023. Uh, this one, I know this author, so it, I know his work, so it could be really good. This one, mm, I know only one. I've only read this author's previous book. I loved it. Thought it was really good. I have complained on this channel many times about how hard it is to find Christian or Christian-themed books that aren't either dumb or full of hatred. <laughs> and if that's frustrating to me as an atheist, I can only imagine how frustrating it is to you Christians. Did you want you want to find a book that will be interesting for you to read that might reflect or help you to reflect on your faith, and instead you're getting 
what? I don't even know. God made puppies or hate the gays. <laughs> if you're a normal Christian, you're not going to want to read either one of those kinds of garbage. And the books that you will get, will they'll be hard to find. This author's previous book was a perfect example of the kind of book that I'm that I'm trying to single out for praise here. And I'm hoping the next one is too. This is Jessica Hooten Wilson, and her new book is Reading for the Love of God. Reading as a spiritual exercise. And if I remember correctly, this book does not just confine itself to reading spiritual books as a spiritual exercise, which, if true, would be fascinating. I, but reading this author, reading this author on prayer and her last outing was eye-opening. Reading her on reading, a dream come true. <laughs> I'll be happy, happy to to, uh, to sign up. Then we have something by Richard Hoyle and Anita Krajnik. This is the Secret Life of Pigs which is natural history and behavior study of pigs, but mainly it's a study of what of pigs that we usually don't see, of meat industry pigs that are never allowed to grow old. They, they are born in torture and pain. They are tortured for a year at the most, and then they're killed. And they're killed in a brutal way. They're, they're not, it's, it's not quick. It's not clean. They see it coming. So most of the time, we don't ever get to meet them when they're this old. The few times that, that there have been examples of that, when, for instance, a, a pig on a truck bound for the slaughterhouse falls off the back of the truck or is found wandering, something like that, the owners go public all the time. With, we took this pig into our house. We had no idea what we were getting into. What a delightful person. How smart, how sensitive, how playful, how utterly individual this person is. And those owners have made a great deal of literature, a great deal of video content, about how horrified they are every time they think about the fate waiting this person who's become a vital member of the family. I have a feeling that this book is mostly about that. It's not the secret life, in other words, of wild pigs that we don't see, but rather the, a life that is secret because we don't allow it to happen. I'm going to read it either way. Uh, if, it, if I stay true to who I am now, I'm going to read it either way. Probably it will be pretty sobering. Then we have something. This is a Harlequin intrigue novel, a Harlequin category romance. I think that this is probably my favorite category romance author who is well-known outside of Harlequin categories. She certainly can float a novel on her own. She doesn't need the category romance, but she still keeps going back there. The author is B.J. Daniels. She is uh, Her specialty is contemporary Western heroes. Horse riding, Stetson wearing contemporary cowboys designed to melt the heart and other parts of the anatomy. <laughs> and this is her latest, Set Up in the City. A perfect example of the juxtaposition that she does so well. You've got the, the, the hero on horseback, but with high, city high-rises in the background. I don't know anything about this book, except that I think it's the third or fourth in a series of books where I've read every other one. So if I come back with a lot of givens in place in 2023, I will certainly want to read it. Talk about a given in place, <laughs> the ultimate segue to this next book. This is by Philip Taubman, and it is a life of George Schultz. Uh, in the nation's service, George Schultz was a, a given in place <laughs> for a number of presidential administrations. He was a kind of phlegmy, establishmentarian voice in the room. He could not get flustered. He could not fly off the handle. He was never in any meeting under any circumstances on any subject unprepared. And he was never, all this is going to seem strange to say, he was never partisan either. There is an argument to be made. I know it's in this cynical age it will be largely laughed at, but there is an argument to be made that he was a public servant, that he really didn't all ultimately care all that much about the political partisanship of any of his executive branch bosses. And there's also an argument to be made that the United States policy, both domestic and international, benefited from having Schultz in the room. I myself would make that argument about a handful of people uh, who were just these gray eminences that kept showing up in different White House administrations back before it was the standard policy in American executive branch politics to scorch earth. If, if my party wins, if I win the White House, I want every single person gone. I don't care what kind of institutional memory they have. I want them all gone because I hate them and they hate me. I'd kill them if I could and they'd kill me if I could. This disease that has taken over American politics, this was from an, an earlier era. I wasn't quite so Newt Gingrich implanted in the national psyche. And so a phenomenon like George Schultz was possible. We'll see what kind of a job the author does on that subject. It's not the first book about Schultz that I've read, but 
And then we have something by, this is by Carl Schlogel, and this is one of the few 2023 releases that I've already read. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. If I am back in 2023, I'm certainly going to want to study the finished copy, pencil in hand. This is the Soviet century, an archaeology of a lost world, an archaeology of what the Soviet world was like. Utterly fascinating. Just utterly fascinating. I loved it. Endlessly thought-provoking. And that's that's before I really dug into its its sources and its tangents and whatnot. That's just going to be more fun. Then we have something by Matt Potter on a subject that I think will probably become more prominent as time goes on, maybe more prominent in 2023 than it was in 2022. This is called We Are All Targets, How Renegade Hackers Invented Cyber War and Unleashed an Age of Global Chaos. The title could not be more true, not just on the national level, but on the individual level as well. But the national level is where it counts and where it can affect your life in terms of rogue nuclear strikes. So so this is the ultimate grim subject, but I try to keep up on these books just to know what's going on. Now, I mentioned earlier that a, an earlier author wrote a big book on the Thirty Years' War, and that, of course, was not the final word. With things like the Thirty Years' War, there never is a final word. As you can tell <laughs> with this next one, this is uh, John Pike, who has written a big book on the Thirty Years' War. <laughs> Will this be substantially different from Peter Wilson's book? Will it say anything different? Will it? Will its proportions be different in terms of what it gives 10 pages to and what it gives 100 pages to? Probably not. Probably not. But we shall see. Just when I become complacent on the subject, I get a book like Sean McMeekin's book, Stalin's War, or The Soviet Century. And all of a sudden, I think what I went in thinking, all right, well, there's no new way for you to do this. And then the author does it in a new way, and I am chastised and very happy. We shall see. I would never let it go by. Then we have a, a bit of a social media phenomenon. This is Tobin Mitnick. And he has finally written a book that reflects his long-standing passion for trees. This is Must Love Trees. There is a cartoon version of our author, who is a handsome young man, and who is uh, an advocate for appreciating, loving, and, of course, conserving trees. We'll see how much this book goes on from the videos that I've watched or documentaries or things like that. I want it to have more, but I imagine it'll be really well illustrated as well, which would make it partially worthwhile. Then we have Rebecca Boggs Roberts. I don't know that I know that name. Her new book is called Untold Power, and it is a biography of Edith Wilson, and who was Wood Wilson's wife. And those of you who aren't familiar with your American history might say, well, okay, well, she was the wife of a president, then she didn't have untold power. He did. But Woodrow Wilson had a crippling stroke, and unbeknownst to the country, Edith Wilson ran his job for him once that happened. So led some insiders inside the Beltway a hundred years ago to say that the White House was a cursed house because Wilson's stroke happened in his administration, but the administration before that, President William Howard Taft's wife had a massive stroke in, in, in when he was in office. Uh, Edith Wilson has been the subject of many, many biographies. It, uh, we'll have to see what this one does that's any different. But uh, First Lady biographies, presidential biographies of any kind, I'm, of course, going to, I'm going to snap up. There's another one on this list. This next one is by Danielle Gasner. This is going to be tough reading, but necessary, if, especially if you're an American. This is USA, the Ruthless Empire. And there is an aircraft carrier as big as a city on the cover. And this book is going to mention... Facts that I have mentioned on this channel before. No matter where you live in the world, no matter where you live, no matter what your government professes to like or dislike about the United States, you could get on your bike and pedal in an afternoon to an enormous U.S. military base. They are everywhere. This, I brought this, this point up most, most recently in connection with people in Canada or Germany or the Netherlands looking at the upheavals in American presidential politics and saying, I feel so sorry for you, Steve. Boy, I'm, it's times like this, I'm really glad it doesn't affect me. <laughs> if Donald Trump comes back into power and his Secretary of State is Nick Fuentes, you're going to realize how quickly those military bases affect you. <laughs> They're not there for decoration. This author will, will no doubt trot out the Noam Chomsky rap sheet of America's evils on the world stage. I'm ready to take it. Most of those evils are true and well-documented. It'll be a little bit depressing to read. This next one is by Kevin Cook. It is called Waco Rising. 
It is the story of the 1993 siege of the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. Interviewing all of the living survivors, interviewing all of the living uh, law enforcement agents, going over all of the testimony, all of the documentation, trying to figure out what happened and what lessons we can learn from it. No doubt this book took a lot of work. I suggest that every single one of you buys a hardcover copy as soon as it gets to your bookstores. Moving on, <laughs> we have David Waldstriker. This is The Odyssey of Phyllis Wheatley. Big book that we've seen on this channel. We saw the advanced copy, I think, of this book. It's about uh, Phyllis Wheatley, who was a slave in Boston, but also a published author and a heavily praised author. And this book it looks like it looks at the bigger societal paradoxes and weirdness of that double standard in a greater extent than any earlier Phyllis Wheatley book has done. If that's true, then this book will be that rare thing, a positive beneficiary of the social upheavals that we all saw a couple of years ago that started with the execution of George Floyd. It would be nice if we could say, in addition to all the bad stuff, it would be nice if we could say that after George Floyd, there was no such thing anymore as a pietistically simplistic book on Phyllis Wheatley or Frederick Douglass or any others. If, if that event and the riots and the reassessments that it caused ups the game of books on the subject. I'm I'm very much looking forward to that being true. I have often been very frustrated by books on subjects like Phyllis Wheatley and the paternalistic tone that they take. And then we have an author who's extremely well known to me. This is Jacqueline Winspear, the author of the Maisie Dobbs books. She has a new book coming out next year. It is the introduction of a new character, Miss Elliot. It's the White Lady. And the first book, if I remember correctly, starts off with a very familiar, very comforting gambit of a woman living, mostly keeping to herself in a small British village. Doesn't seem anything remarkable on the surface, but she is remarkable, very much so. And when events embroil her, everyone involved finds out exactly how. She is a trained killer, first of all, a trained intelligence operative, who never thought to, to go back into that world. I would read anything that this author wrote. I'm So the white lady, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And then we have, I believe this is the final book on the list. No, no, we have a few more to go. Uh, let's, let's look at this one. This is by Alan Corbin. This is the history of the wind. Now you have a clipper ship on the cover, but this is not a history of wind-driven sailing vessels. This is a history of as much as you can determine what the phenomenon of wind on Earth builds as a history. When has it affected human civilization? What is it like? What's its natural history, so to speak? I don't think I've ever read a book like this before. I don't imagine that it will be very successful. I'll have to be proven wrong on that subject. I remember that for 100 years in the American book market, if a new book was on publisher lists and said it was a history of whales, for 100 years, it was certainly going to be a history of whaling which I railed against in many, many a book review, in many, many an editorial. Those two things are not the same. If this is a history of wind as it affects humans only, and that's just it, and that's all it is, and that's everything that's in it, that's, <laughs> I think we're going to be right back to that, to that level. But we shall see. I could be proven wrong. Then we have some contemporary literary fiction. This is a lot more, this author tends to be a lot more bearable in that regard than most literary fiction writers do. This is Paul Tremblay, and this is his new book, The Beast You Are. He specializes in uh, kind of noir, contemporary, horror-tinged short fiction, and some of it is really good. I don't think I've ever read any of the stories in this book. I think they're all new to this book. We shall see. I'm, I'm totally up for it. Then we have the great Otto Penzler, the great editor, Otto Penzler. He has a new volume coming out in the American Mystery Classic series. This is the golden age of biblio mysteries, so murder mysteries that have some sort of bookish theme. Otto Penzler is really great at pulling in the obvious candidates for an anthology like this, but also lots that aren't obvious. His Any book that he edits is worthwhile just on its face. He's one of the rare figures in the literary world where that is true, where an editor is an autobuy. And so I will definitely take this. I imagine that uh, that quite a few of the stories and authors in there will be familiar to me. There, there have been a few big Biblio mystery volumes, but it, there's always there's a particular a particular nerdy joy in reading a murder mystery that revolves around books. <laughs> we shall see if it. Uh, then we have uh, this is also a known quantity. I've praised this author on this channel many times before. This is Mark Greeny. The Burner is his new Gray Man novel. 
The Gray Man, I think, will be a lot better known to a wider audience thanks to its cinematic adaptation. But the books are incredible. Just amazingly good. They're a thinking person's Tom Clancy, a thinking person's men's adventure story where you don't have to turn off your brain or reduce yourself to some sort of rah-rah eight-year-old with a beanie propeller in order to like the contents of the book. I like very much that Mark Green, he does not write down to his audience. That, that makes the Gray Man book so enjoyable. Then we have a Marvel epic collection, another comic book reprint. This one is Marvel instead of DC. And it's a reprint of a fairly disastrous era and one of the amazing Spider-Man, but the Marvel's doing epic collections of almost everything. Uh, this one is the Spider-Man clone? Spider-Man or Spider-Clone? There is uh, a great cover. That stuff by the great on the street is something called litter. We don't have that in America anymore, but once upon a time we did. And the, the fashionable white boot with the high heels, Spider-Man is pointing at someone. Spider-Man fans, when they saw this cover, immediately knew who that was, and they could not believe it. They simply could not believe that any Marvel writer would be craven enough, have bad enough taste, to bring Gwen Stacy back from the dead. And what resulted was a, a horrible mash of Spider-Man issues that should never have been written. <laughs> so, so you can count on this showing up in an epic comic book Wednesday in the new year. Then we have uh, an author, literary fiction, definitely, but a non-missable a non author, even for me, Colson Whitehead, his new book, Crook Manifesto can't not read a new Colson Whitehead novel. Not if your bailiwick is the one that I've set out for myself. Major new releases in the American book market. The fiction releases don't get any major, more major than Colson Whitehead, so 2033 has one. Uh, then we have, uh, this has been out in the UK. I've watched a lot of UK booktube channels that have praised it, talked about it. It's Essex Dogs by the historian Dan Jones. I've, most of the the booktube accounts that I have heard of this have been hyperventilating in praise. I'm not 100% sure why that is. Nothing that I've read from this author in terms of nonfiction has ever been hypervent-worthy. <laughs> Maybe he hits his stride in fiction. I'm pretty sure this is his first novel. I'm definitely going to give it a try. I didn't think it was going to get an American release, but since it is, I will. Then we have uh, Samantha Shannon. A lot of you will know this author from her immense and wonderful book, The Prior of the Orange Tree. Here we have its sequel, also almost a thousand pages long. This is A Day of Fallen Night, once again with a gorgeous cover that I'm hoping the finished copy will look every bit as pretty as the, the Prior to the Orange Tree. Prior to the Orange Tree definitely left me wanting more, and it had plenty of unresolved plot lines, so I will give this a try uh, if I'm still around and myself. It would be a natural choice if I am. Same thing with this next one, a presidential biography. I can't get enough of them. I'm hoping that I will review them forever. <laughs> At least now I am. Uh, this last year, 2022, I, I read all the, pres the major presidential biographies that came out. And the highlight for me was reviewing a biography of Grover Cleveland. Really didn't see that coming. <laughs> and if that was unexpected, this one certainly is. This is by C.W. Goodyear, and it is President Garfield. And once again... The book is trying to claim that this overlooked footnote of a president was a radical, a radical thinker, an important figure in American political history. And like with the Grover Cleveland book, they have decided to go with a high-detail, colorized photo to make him seem less like a bearded figure of the pharisaical past and more like someone who was once alive, as Garfield certainly was. I don't know what to make of this, but then again, I didn't know what to make of the Grover, Grover Cleveland. And there was there were a couple before that as well. So... Uh, it, it, it would definitely, if I had it in front of me now, I would definitely want to read it. This next one is going to seem a little bit undressed. You cognoscenti will know why. This is Michael Katz's translation of The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. You'll note that the cover design is very similar to this translator's edition of Crime and Punishment. The only thing missing from the cover is a quote from yours truly. I am not blurbed on the Brothers Karamazov, but after the job this author did translating Crime and Punishment, I am all there for the translation. Whether I'm blurbed on it or not, I'm all there for it. So a new translation of the Brothers Karamazov, that's no small thing. And then we have a novel. This could be a fairly feel-good novel. I'm not really sure. This is by Patrick DeWitt, and it's called The Librarianist, which is not a word. If it were a word, it might refer to somebody who studies librarians or who collects them under glass or something like that. As far as I can remember, this is a novel about a librarian who's about to retire. 
and finds new relationships in life. No idea where the coinage and the title comes from. I'll have to read the book to find out, I guess. Then we have The Mistress of Batya House. This is by Sujata Matsi. This, this is her uh, Purveen Mystery series about, a, well, the at the time, the only female detective in India. These are historical murder mysteries. They are marvelously well done. Marvelously well. I cannot praise them high enough. You should you should find the first couple of these. Uh, try, if you can, to find the first one so that, you know, you were introduced to the character. That's always a good idea to get introduced to the character and then just follow this series. You're going to love it. Long may it go on. I don't even... I, I was a little bit worried when it veered in the last installment into explicit politics. She handled it perfectly. So I, I talk about an auto-read author. Then we have something by Patrick Dean called Nature's Messenger. And this is about a naturalist who came to the, the New World, he came to the world of the Americas with its vast teeming amounts of nature that no one had ever studied. He came to America decades, a century before Audubon did, and did a lot of groundbreaking research. I don't think that Catesby has a Library of America volume. I don't think, I think he had a, an old Dover paperback reprint of a few things that has been out of print forever and has no successor. So for, for Patrick Dean to go back into the records and study this figure, bring him forward again, that's fantastic. Uh, it's probably going to have a little too much nature slaughtering for my liking, but I'll still, I'll take it, definitely. Then we have Julianne Long. She is represented on my, my romance bookshelf many, many times. This is her new book, How to Tame a Wild Rogue. This is, as I've mentioned on this channel many times before, a contemporary regency. Sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it is not an old-fashioned regency romance. It's set in the Regency period or roughly thereabouts, but it won't have any of the Regency lingo. And you can see some of the, the differences right away on the cover, since not only is the man topless, but the man and woman on this cover are engaged in the act of sex, <laughs> which of course is not present in traditional Regency romances. Uh, we'll see. I, I'm a big fan of Regency's contemporary or not. Then we have a book by Lawrence Jerdam called The Rough Rider and the Professor. This is about Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. And I confess, the title gives me the willies. Because Theodore Roosevelt wasn't a rough rider when he was in when he was in the White House and when he was governor of New York. He wasn't a rough rider anymore. That seems like a one-dimensional reduction of his character. For most of the time that he was in office, he was at least as much of a professor as Cabot Lodge was. But I'm hoping that this book contains lots of original research into Henry Cabot Lodge, who hasn't had a biography of his own, a full-dress biography of his own in America, in a century, and really deserves one. At least that I know of. I've never seen one. Uh, then we have, this is by Nicholas Humphrey. This is Sentience. And it is not necessarily only about AI. I think this is mainly about what we consider to be sentience just in general, in human physiology, in the human lived experience. It might get a little wonky for me. It also, books like this sometimes get a little philosophical for me. There's nothing philosophical about this subject at all. There can't be. But uh, the author could surprise me. And, oh my, goodness gracious, that's it. <laughs> that's it. So we have, here, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with the, the only visual that counts. <laughs> we'll, uh, that's it. That is 60 books from 2023. That if I am back and me, I will probably want to read. So uh, they aren't really uh, read what you own, because <laughs> I don't own any of them yet, except for the Soviet century. And I'm not following that challenge anyway. I'm too, I'm too enamored of book hunting. But they're on my radar. They are, they are definitely on, at least now, provisionally, a TBR for the new year. I saw David Wiley do it, and I thought I would imitate him. <laughs> so I will wrap this up at long last, and I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.